Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to the Anglican Church of the Good Shepherd in Calgary. I'm the Reverend Erwin Kostanak, the priest of the parish, and I'm glad you've tuned in this morning, not just for this service because it's the next one on the list, but because it also continues the season of Lent, which we began with our Ash Wednesday service just this past week. And so now as we go into these five Sundays that make up this season, we will explore that theme that is characteristic of the season, a theme of penitence and contemplation, of reflection, basically being honest with ourselves, being honest before God, coming clean before God, and, and how we do that can be done in a variety of ways. We're going to start something a little bit unique for these five Sundays. I will begin by preaching a three-part series based on a, an approach that I've never done before when it comes to preaching, and I'll explain more of that in a few moments when the time comes for this sermon. And then the last two Sundays of the season of Lent, our pastoral intern Margaret Hogarth will preach, and we will hear what it is that she will bring to the table in this time of reflection. And so that's something to look forward to. We invite you to take in and participate in all five of these services. But now let us begin this service, this abbreviated liturgy, as it were, as we turn our attention and bring our hearts and minds together to worship our Lord and our God. And so, my friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to, to you, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God of the wilderness, your Son battled with the powers of darkness and grew closer to you in the desert. Help us to use these 40 days to grow in wisdom and prayer, so that we may witness to your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now let us turn our attention to the proclamation of the word. A reading from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul, O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. A reading from the Gospel according to St. Mark. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, 
proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The Gospel of Christ. A couple of months ago, a dear friend and colleague of mine presented me with a challenge. This is a challenge that she herself had received a little bit earlier, and she's doing a number of us a favor by passing that challenge on to us as well. The Reverend Helen Dunn is the vicar of Christ Church Cathedral in Vancouver, part of the Anglican Diocese of New Westminster. And she and I have a friendship that goes back some time. You see, we were ordained to the priesthood together on January 25th, 2014. Now, I know some of you might be thinking quickly and think, oh, January 25th, that's kind of cool. Robbie Burns night, hey, what a great day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, in the liturgical calendar, January 25th is the day that we commemorate the conversion of St. Paul. So that was the occasion for our ordination. Nevertheless, in the months prior to that and on that day and ever since, Helen and I have been really close friends. So when she presented me with this challenge, there was this natural inclination to go ahead and accept that and to take it on myself as well. So what was this challenge, you ask? Well, this is what it was. Take a period of time, whether it might be a month or a season or something, and endeavor to do my, the challenge was for me to endeavor to do my sermonizing. That is to say, all of my reading and preparation and writing of a sermon and then the delivering of a sermon, to try to do all of that without referring to any resources written by a white male. Now, first blush, that might seem to be a little arbitrary or whatever, but when you stop and think about it for a minute, the majority of the theological resources that are available to us in North America are usually written by white men. What difference would it make if I was to use material written by a woman or by a person of color or somebody from a completely different cultural milieu from my own? That challenge actually is worth exploring and so I was happy to take it up. Now, because I already had Christmas ideas in mind and epiphany in mind, the thought was that I would do it now. Over these next three Sundays in the season of Lent, these three sermons are going to be written without referencing white guys. That's what I endeavored to do. And so I asked Helen for some suggestions of some resources that she had found helpful so I could start exploring who I might want to uh, draw from because I'm actually ashamed to say it. it. It took a little bit of work to try to find other resources. Of course, once you know what to look for, it's not so hard. But anyway, she gave me these resources, and one I chose to work with was a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. It was written by the Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman. He was born in 1899, died in 1981. He's an American black preacher. He grew up in Florida, ended up pastoring in San Francisco, involved in a variety of ways with uh, uh, being a Christian minister. But uh, his context brings about an exploration of Jesus that provides a perspective that, to be honest, I had not had myself. And I don't know how likely it would have been that I would have taken that perspective if I had not been reading his book. The book, Jesus and the Disinherited, was written in 1949, drawing on material that uh, Thurman had been using before, and he provides this unique perspective, being a black man living in the segregated United States, with all their Jim Crow laws and everything, his grandmother had been a slave, he knew what it was to be a person who had his back up against the wall. That's actually an important uh, turn of phrase he uses throughout the book. That the book is about what exactly the gospel of Jesus Christ has to say to those whose backs are against the wall. Now let's just unpack that phrase for a little bit. If you have someone in front of you who is uh, aggressive, who is more powerful than you, who could do violence to you, you tend to retreat from that person. You want to stay away from the threat. But what happens is as you keep backing up, you can find yourself suddenly against a wall. And now you've got nowhere to go. You could move to the, the left or right, but that doesn't really change the fact that the threat is right before you. And now with your back against the wall, you are at the mercy of the person who is providing that threat. This is who Thurman has in mind in writing his book. 
And in order for us to understand that, he says we need to grasp that Jesus was very much speaking to people who had their backs against the wall. You see, one of the observations Thurman was making, which is part of the reason why he was writing the book too, is he couldn't help but look and see that for some reason, Christianity itself seemed to be rather impotent in addressing the discrimination and injustices that would happen on the basis of race and social status and so on. That you look and you see people like, again, you know, African Americans like himself were being left out of the loop by largely white people in America, and it seemed that the Christian faith couldn't do anything about it. What's going on here? Why is this happening? How should we respond? These are all the questions that, that he's exploring in his book. And because of that perspective, he actually does another interesting thing as he writes. When he speaks about what he would see that the words of Jesus would have to say to the people who live as ones who have their backs up against the wall, he refers to the faith then as the religion of Jesus, rather than referring, it at, referring to it as Christianity. I might wonder why would we do that? Well, well, here are a couple of reasons. First of all, the word religion, uh, when it appears in the Bible, for example, in the epistle of James, it gives a definition. True religion is this, to look after widows and orphans in their distress. So when the word religion appears in the Bible, it is very much something that has to do with action and, and acting in grace and mercy and compassion. It, it doesn't have to do with belief and doctrine and theology. So when he's speaking to people about the religion of Jesus, he's talking about the things that Jesus said and did and demonstrated that we are to follow. So it puts it in a different category than merely belief. But there's another reason he does that. And that is because for African Americans in, 20th, in the 20th century, and to a large extent even today, Christianity is what was imposed upon them by their white masters, by the white people who would oppress them. And so Christianity as a whole was a movement that would be holding them down, that actually contributed to their oppression. That's another observation that Thurman made. Why is it that the Christian faith, which emerged from a time where people were themselves being oppressed, ended up becoming this thing that far too often was used to oppress others? One of the things that his grandma, his former slave grandmother, had said to him when he was younger was that she would never read the Apostle Paul because the white masters would always read where Paul says, slaves, obey your masters as to the Lord. For her, hearing those words were tremendously difficult because they were used as a bludgeon to keep her oppressed. So Thurman asks the question, why does Christianity do this? Why has Christianity done this? And by using this term, the religion of Jesus, instead, he's trying to shape it differently for those who would listen so that they might respond in a different way than what had been conditioned in them because of this oppression. Okay, enough background in that sense. Um, the reason we're exploring this in the first place, as I said earlier, was to see what might come about in my understanding, and by extension your understanding, our understanding together, about the gospel of Jesus Christ by taking a different perspective, and by taking a perspective like Howard Thurman's. Howard begins his, by his book um, making three observations about Jesus that he would say are, are crucial for us to understand what's going on with all that he's doing and saying and teaching. The first thing is that Jesus is, was, a, was a Jew. Now, you might think that's not that earth-shattering. You've heard me mention that before. Of course, Jesus is Jewish. But Thurman's saying, now, no, wait a minute, let's, let's just process this. Because Jesus was Jewish, he grew up as an identifiable part of a people group that had a particular way of living, a particular cultural approach to things. They, of course, had their dietary laws and, and different uh, procedures that they would follow in any number of ways of conducting life and so on, not to mention the specific practices of worship that they had. But that also meant that the history of the ancient Israelites was taught to Jesus as part of his identity. 
As Jesus is growing up as a young child, as a teenager, a young man, before he starts his ministry at about age 30, he would have been not only learning just the stark facts of history, but understanding that that was part of who he was. The challenges that Israel faced, the exile that they experienced under Assyria and Babylon a few hundred years earlier, the the restoration under the Persians that was theirs, the problem of the Greek Empire overrunning them, and now that the Roman Empire was located right where they were supposed to live, he grew up understanding that this isn't the way it's supposed to be. He grew up understanding that where he is living now is not the ideal picture. He would have witnessed what Roman soldiers were able to do to other Jewish people just because they were the occupying force. He was able to see that their identity as Jews was being held down by the overarching identity of the Romans. I'm going to come back to that a little bit more in a minute, but let me go on to this second thing. Jesus not only was Jewish, but he was also poor. This is seen because when the time came for the ritual of purification after his birth, Mary and Joseph did not bring a lamb, which was the standard sacrifice for that procedure, but instead they brought a couple of doves. The Torah allowed for this for people who couldn't afford to bring a lamb. And the idea that you would bring a lamb was the the natural expected thing. This wasn't like only the wealthy people could bring a lamb. Your average middle-class Jewish person would would, would bring a lamb. Like most of us watching this video would, you know, we would expect, yeah, we'd bring a lamb, right? So it's only when you're poor within that culture that you end up having to bring this lesser gift. Mary and Joseph had to bring these two little birds. Jesus grew up as a poor person. He wasn't even middle class. And so as a result then, he also knew the additional challenges of dealing with very, very limited resources and not having access to certain things because of his poverty. That's another way in which people have their backs up against the wall. So Jesus is Jewish, Jesus is poor, and thirdly, Jesus, as I alluded to earlier, was part of an oppressed group of people. And again, that would would have made up his understanding. It would have made up part of his psyche, as it were. The Roman Empire governed Israel. Yeah, King Herod was there for a while, but he was basically a puppet king under the control of the Romans. And after his day, and and they moved onward, basically the Jews were able to conduct worship the way they wanted to, but they could not really govern themselves the way they wanted to. The final say was always with Rome. And that meant Rome enforced this by having soldiers around. And so what Jesus would have grown up learning is he always had to be mindful of that soldier over there. After all, he's got a weapon. He could run you through if he felt like it. He'd probably face some consequences or whatever, but basically, what are you going to do? He's got that sword. And if he comes up to you and you're talking with your family and friends about making plans about whatever, and he says, hey, you, get over here. I need you to carry my pack for me. And then he dumps his rucksack on your back. You have to walk with him for a mile. And he says, okay, thanks a lot, buddy. Just head back and do whatever. And now you got to walk that mile back. Didn't matter what your plans were, suddenly it's overturned because his Roman soldier is saying, this is what you must do for me. Not to mention the other abuses the soldiers might impose on the Jews there. Let's also consider the fact that Jesus would have grown up witnessing crucifixions. Because the crucifixions that the Romans did, they did rather well. They were very practiced at it. Anybody who was perceived as being an insurrectionist or an enemy of the state of Rome, as it were, faced execution by crucifixion. Thousands of people, thousands of Jews, had been crucified during the time of Jesus' growing up years. It's not like he was the first one when it was finally his turn. Thinking back to Howard Thurman's perspective in the early half of the 20th, in the the first half of the 20th century, how many lynchings did he witness? How many times did he witness an African-American being mistreated? being beaten, being killed, being unjustly treated. How many did Jesus see? 
And would it not have felt the same? That here his fellow countrymen are being put up on display on these horrible crosses because Rome was in charge and they were not. When we grasp where Jesus was coming from, and when this perspective is given to us because we have read this observation from somebody who lived something that was not dissimilar. I mean, let, let, let's be honest here, right? I have not been persecuted growing up. Oh yeah, sure, people would disagree with me. Other kids make, might make fun of me because I was a Christian or whatever, but I am not persecuted. I have never been persecuted. Howard Thurman has been persecuted for his race. Jesus and his fellow Jews were persecuted and held down by the Romans. When we understand that and gain that perspective, now what Jesus was up to takes on a bit of a different shape. So now imagine this. Jesus is now 30 years old. He is fully identified as a Jew. He's been living on the lower end of the economic scale, and he's been aware his entire life of the oppressive presence of Rome, keeping the Israelites down, keeping them from being able to be the independent people they would long to be. And now he's going to begin to speak. He's going to begin to teach. At his birth, there are already a couple of hints that something was going to happen because in both Mary's song and Zachariah's song, there are these references to the fact that God is throwing off the oppressor and pushing down those who are powerful. Who do you think those powerful ones are that they had in mind when they were sharing those words? And when Jesus, on the first day of his official formal ministry, goes into the synagogue and uh, uses Isaiah chapter 61 and says, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me because he's told me to proclaim good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Now suddenly those words have a different feel because we could see the vivid reality of Rome's pressure on Jews. And now when Jesus goes to speak and to preach, the good news that he is sharing is not just about the idea that if you just follow me, you can have your best life now, or you could just know blessing if you would just give your heart to me. But he's saying things that have to do with dealing with the reality of the oppression of Rome. So when he tells fellow Jews that they have to love their enemies, he isn't just talking about loving that neighbor who annoys you. He's talking about loving these soldiers with weapons that they use to coerce you. We're going to get into that in the next couple of weeks. But what I want to leave you with this morning is just the opportunity to contemplate and to think about it. What difference does it make to you now to think about the things Jesus said and did in light of this knowledge. Imagine Jesus, who is an African-American living in the first half of the 20th century in America, living through segregation, living through the Jim Crow laws, living through all of those kinds of injustices. Imagine Jesus is a black man in America, and he is now wanting to teach what God's will and purpose would be in the midst of an environment that wants to suppress him because of white America. What do his words sound like to his audience? When he says, if someone forces you to walk one mile, go with them too, what difference does that make now? When he says, do not resist an evil person, where are we going? What's happening there? So in these next two weeks, we're going to explore the remainder of his book, uh, Thurman's book, Jesus and the Disinherited to see what it has to say to those who are disinherited and what we who are not living as disinherited ones can learn from that. It's a helpful thing to explore a different perspective. It's something that will stretch us and challenge us. It is something that will cause us to look in a fuller way at the gospel of Jesus Christ and to find that we have much to learn from others. And there's some wisdom 
in making sure that we are well read broadly from this variety of perspectives. So I invite you to come on this journey with me. We look forward to what's happening next week. If you want to look up the book, you can find it for yourself. It'll only take you three and a half hours to read. But otherwise, we'll talk to you next week and go deeper into this exploration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. This might be kind of strange doing this on video, but I do invite you to the bidding Lord in your mercy to join in where you are with the response, hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us to this new week. Preserve us by your mighty power that this coming week we may not fall into sin. Let us not be overcome by the challenges that may rise to face us, nor be apathetic to any of the suffering we may see. In all we do, guide us to the fulfilling of your purposes. Father, we acknowledge your creation of which we are part. You pronounced it good, yet so often we exploit it and each other, leaving destruction and pain in our wake. Forgive us for our thoughtlessness and our taking advantage of your blessings. Let us walk carefully on the earth and in harmony with each other and all of creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We thank you that you welcome our prayers and that you delight in meeting our needs. Let us remember that we are all members of your body and grant us your Holy Spirit to guide and strengthen us to think, speak, and act in accordance with your will. In this season of Lent, we are mindful of how we live selfishly with limited concern for those around us. Forgive us our blindness to the needs of others. We pray for those we have injured or offended, either accidentally or intentionally. With your assistance, may we learn to love those who are different from us. We ask you for the grace to amend our lives and to further the extent of your kingdom in our spheres of influence. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We thank you, Father, that we live in a community with the knowledge and resources to lead us through this pandemic. We pray for those in leadership over us, those in public health, and those in all levels of government. Bless our leaders with guidance, wisdom, and discernment as they lead us through this pandemic and into the rollout of vaccinations. Grant us the grace and the patience to await their direction. Thank you for our homes where we can isolate ourselves in safety and for the knowledge of how to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Even in this trying time, remind us of all the good things you have provided to us and let us never take them for granted. We also thank you for our church community. We ask for wisdom and protection as we walk our way through this difficult time separated from each other. Keep us mindful of how we injure, insult, and offend you and those with whom we live and work. Bring us to repentance and let us turn to you for the grace to amend our lives and to live every minute of every day in light of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. We remember before you parts of the world that are struggling. The news is full of reports of sick and hurting and hungry people affected by disease, injury, violence, and natural disasters. We think of the large areas of the U.S. that are struggling under the blast of cold weather and experiencing disruptions in electricity, water, and food distribution. Bring them relief and give wisdom to those providing assistance. The virus continues throughout the world and our country and our city. Protect and strengthen all those who care for the sick. We thank you for the development and the effectiveness of the vaccines and ask wisdom to our leaders in rolling them out. We are concerned about the development and spread of virus variants. Let us not lose heart, but remember that you are not surprised by events 
and you will not turn your backs on us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. In our worldwide Anglican communion, we pray for the Church of the Province of Central Africa. We pray for our companion diocese in the Windward Islands and ask you to bless St. Philip Mesopotamia with St. Matthias and St. Joseph on St. Vincent and their clergy, Ashton Francis. In our Diocese of Calgary, we pray for St. George Stetler and their clergy, David Holmes and Jack Schultz. We ask your blessing for our church leaders, Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Linda, Primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, Mark, National Indigenous Anglican Archbishop, and Greg, Archbishop of Calgary and Metropolitan of Rupert's Land. We pray for Derwin, our priest. Encourage and strengthen him as he works to lead us through these times when we are dispersed, yet still provide us with meaningful worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in other Christian churches in our part of Calvary, in particular today for the people of the Evangelical Covenant Church of Canada, South Sudanese, Canadian, New Air Congregation, and their pastor, Kek Luke, and also for the people of Westside King's Church. We remember before you the community of our congregation, and in particular today we pray for the Obodo, Orleman, Parkinson, and Payette families. May they know your presence this week in a special way. We pray for those of us who are shut in or have chronic concerns, especially Annie Kibblewhite and Veronica Martel. Gracious God, you are the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, and hear the cry of those in misery and need. We pray especially for those among us who have special concerns and who are on our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Gracious God, we know you hear the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and are mindful of our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. Let us with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins, that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And now may the God of mercy transform you by his grace, and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and all whom you care for, this day and always. Amen. Amen.